But never fear, we'll be back next year and we're already making plans for a uh, spring 2021 version of Atlantic Biocon. So stay tuned for more on that. In the meantime, um, the partners remain committed to facilitating opportunities for information transfer, communications and networking with respect to the bioeconomy. And in support of this commitment, we have developed the Atlantic Biocon virtual speaker spirit series. And what we plan to do is invite engaging speakers to provide their views on a range of uh, relevant and thought provoking bioeconomy topics from around the world. Today, we are hosting our uh, inaugural session of the Atlantic Biocon virtual speaker series and we've invited Ensign to speak. So just a little background on uh, Ensign. Uh, Ensign produce a bio crude product from forest and agricultural residues, and they do this using a thermal conversion technology. The bio crude can be used in a number of applications, including food ingredients, natural chemicals, and heating fuels. You're probably familiar with Ensign. They're certainly one of our premier bioeconomy businesses in Canada and they built their first flagship facility, just recently commissioned that uh, at um, Port Cartier, in Port Cartier, in Quebec. We've invited uh, David Boulard, who's the president of Ensign, and as well as JC Amato, who is Ensign's VP of Finance. Unfortunately, we're having a little bit of trouble connecting JC in, so David may have to carry the weight of this, but I have quite a level of confidence in his ability to do that. So what they'll be doing is discussing their lessons learned, um, having built and developed a liquid biomass business in the Northeastern US over the last decade. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, David shortly, but first a few housekeeping items. Um, the session is being recorded and our plan is to make it available through social media. We'll be sure to let you know how you can access this uh, once we have it available. The second point is after David and JC present, we'll do a question and answer session. And as they are speaking, if you are thinking of questions, please feel free to enter them in the question and answer uh, menu item at the bottom of your screen. You click on that, it'll bring up a window. You can enter your, uh, your questions in there and then we'll address them uh, as we can. Hopefully we won't run out of time. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions. We'll try and mount under the chat window as well, um, but that's a, a little bit challenging. If you are able to direct your questions to the question and, and answer window, that would be fantastic. Um, and the final housekeeping point is, this is a, a series, a speaker series, as I mentioned before. So we are planning a, um, we are planning a number of these. Our plan is to do them monthly, and we are confirming up new speakers and topics as we speak and we'll inform you of these as they are confirmed and become available. So with that, uh, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome David, and uh, hopefully JC will be able to join us at some point, but David, David, maybe if I can turn it over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, Ensign and, uh, and your journey. Perfect, well thank you, Rod. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, again, welcome. Uh, look forward to an opportunity to start a dialogue and, you know, continue life as, uh, as we know it in this venue. And as much as I would have loved to have been in PEI this weekend, uh, I, this is a great second opportunity. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, I'm excited to give you an update on uh, some of the commercial aspects that Ensign has been focused on, not only in uh, developing but also in commercially launching in different areas and so uh, with that I'll, I'll get into the presentation I just to introduce myself my name is David Boulard and I missed some of Rod's introduction unfortunately um, but I'm the president of Ensign Technologies I'm based out of Ottawa and have a number of facilities that I look after uh, while I do have a finance background I'm very much operational so focused on how to get products uh, all the way to commercial customer markets um, JC Amato, uh, who is our VP of Finance and also Corporate Development, was supposed to join me today and we've unfortunately had some technical difficulties. Um, and so I will be doing JC's part as well and I'm, I'm thankful for, uh, 
for uh, JC's uh, assistance in preparing this, these slides as well. So I'll do my best on his component, um, but that's the case. So I wonder, uh, and Ryan, I trust that the, um, that the slides are up. Is that correct? I'll bring them up right now. Perfect, thank you. Um, and you can go to slide two, actually, uh, Ryan, if you don't mind. And the intention today, as I mentioned, was to go through and give everybody an update as to where advanced biofuels from cellulosic material are, um, are coming from and what the status, the commercial status is. We have a lot of, obviously in Canada, we have a tremendous resource as it relates to cellulosic material and including the forestry sector. Uh, to, to the large extent. And, and as we go through, I'll call it a transition in our traditional ways that we do things, both from a pulp and paper or mill um, and engineered uh, wood basis, we look at how we can transition some of the economics, some of the diversification of products, and some of the value chain associated with it. Um, and thank you, Ryan, I see the slides now. Um, and so, you know, the intention today is to provide another uh, insight, I guess, into what's coming down the pipes or what's available as it relates to transitioning, transitioning cellulosic material into diversified markets, including the energy markets. I'll just go quickly through an Ensign corporate background, just for those of you that don't know us and who we are. We've been in the renewable energy business and, and with our core processing equipment for over 20 years. So that, what does that say? Well, it says we have operating experience. We have a, a proven technology that's been commercialized. And so from, from really a, a risk perspective, the, the, the context or the message there is that we're beyond um, bench scale. We're actually in, com um, in commercial operation, so operating 24-7. So really what we re represent is an application opportunity, not, a, not necessarily a technology risk, and that's core uh, to who we are. Now, the, core, the markets that we've been focused on in the past uh, number of years has been energy, so that includes renewable heating fuels, and we'll talk about that a bit more specifically today of how you take solid biomass, create a liquid, and then use it for heating fuels and what that looks like and what the customer base looks like. Um, and we also have refinery applications. I'm not talking about refineries today. I know that there are refinery opportunities available in multiple different regions, but I'll, I'll hold that to maybe another seminar or uh, webinar. And then finally, there's the chemical aspects. Uh, the advantages of making a liquid product allows you to to take advantage of extracting different things out of, the, out of that liquid stream. Why would we do that? Well, it, it enhances the economics. There's some, some different value components that, that you can extract that add tremendous value. So clearly the synergy between the energy and the chemical side is not to be lost and offers a lot of valuable uh, development opportunities that we can talk about uh, later, later, but it also provides for the economies of scale, meaning you're not dependent on one product. So you can go big in production facilities and yet draw a rather small stream of chemicals off that enhance the economics in their entirety. So on, on the right-hand side of the stream, screen, you'll see some, just some highlights that I'll highlight. We have nine facility plants in operation in both in the chemical and the, in the renewable energy side. We have about 50 million liters of that installed capacity that's available for renewable fuel oil production. I'll use that term renewable fuel oil as representing our branded fuel that we use in most heating applications. So just in that context, I'll either use renewable fuel oil or I'll use RFO. Uh, we have about 80 million liters uh, capacity of future potential Canadian uh, facilities and also scheduled or identified for Atlantic Canada, but also other regions of Canada. And then finally, you know, our, our network goes beyond Canada and uh, we have tremendous partners that I'll talk about uh, later, um, but there is also another 150 million uh, liters of capacity that are scheduled for uh, basically ready to go in other countries outside of Canada. So the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Ryan. So let's take a look at the heating business overview. So 
as I've mentioned, we've been servicing customers for a, a long time. So what's renewable fuel oil? Well, it's that it's a, it's basically a cellulosic derived fuel that displaces heating oil, coal in some instances, less so lately, and natural gas and commercial and industrial boilers. And we've been doing that since the 1980s. You know, the customer base that we enjoy right now is is what you would is the typical industrial uh, customer, which would include a hospital, uh, a, a college, and we'll go specifically into a case study of both those. But we look at customers that have institutional boilers uh, that may be on natural gas, number, number four or number six, um, and look at displacing those fossil fuel components. I should mention too that you know, outside of typical uh, schools, hospitals, we also have a district energy center that we service um, that provides uh, energy for a number of different buildings locally. We look at the opportunity to service existing boiler uh, customers whereby we can do a boiler retrofit um, and provide for a relatively no, low capital, low intrusive um, conversion over to our fuel from their traditional fuels. So we can go into a number of different environments, preferably in a boiler setting, an existing boiler setting. We have, again, as I mentioned, lower retrofit costs. We use existing infrastructure, existing boilers. We do put our own equipment in, our own burner, for example, uh, and a fuel delivery line. Um, but for the most part, from boiler on, it's, it's the existing infrastructure. We, our RFO, we try to be cost competitive. Now it is, it is a function of regulatory environments. It's a function of what the current pricing is in the region. Um, but we also look at the benefits of greenhouse gas, whether it be provincial um, or federal incentives or programs that allow for this transition to occur. Um, but again, depending on, on, on existing fossil fuel arrangements. And of course, we always provide for the redundancy factor, meaning you can imagine one of our first customers being a hospital, it was important for them to ensure that they had a security of supply of heat. And so that was a key to make sure that they were readily available to have uh, access to their traditional fuel so that there was no interruption. Uh, next slide, please. So our case study number one is Bates College. Bates College is in Lewiston, Maine. It has about 1,800 students. It, it's a typical college campus that's spread out with multiple buildings. I have some of the detail on that slide for those that are more technical in the audience to identify the, the nature of the horsepower of the, uh, of the boilers. Uh, their existing fuel was number two. Uh, they also have uh, natural gas on site. We retrofitted that, those boilers uh, in, uh, in, in 2016 and, and they initiated operations in 2017. Um, and we supply approximately 3.8 million liters of fuel um, annually to them. What's, what Bates College is one of those leaders in, um, in, in climate change. And so it was very important for them to recognize and um, uh, the benefits and meeting the milestones of what they were. So, you know, they were able to not only s save money based on their existing infrastructure, but they were able to um, significantly reduce their carbon footprint and become carbon neutral. Now that, you know, everybody talks about that on forecast basis, but this college actually accomplished it and to a large part with the use of, with the use of our product RFO. And there's some comments and again, I encourage you to go on the Bates sites. They've got some interesting and fascinating um, reports on that progress and how things are going in that regard. On next slide is a case study number two. Now Memorial Hospital was one of our first customers. So you can imagine the board, boardroom discussion about uh, as the trustees talked about doing a full switch over to, uh, you know, in effect a liquid wood provided by this company. And, uh, and so they were our first customer. They've been with us now for over five years uh, and they run pretty much 100% on, um, on uh, RFO. Uh, again, for the technical people, there's details there. They're a smaller unit. They run at about 1.1 million liters a year. Um, and, they, and again, the results were focused on, 
on energy savings as well as you know again you can see the 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 efficiency of the uh, of the boilers themselves and their carbon emission reductions achieving over 85 percent using our product um, you know so they these have two case studies just represent a, a typical type of customer that would look at you know switching over to rfo and what that would mean key differentials in the next slide you know lower how do we differentiate ourselves and meaning the rfo in in as it relates to maybe other alternatives um lower so basically we're an easy integration into existing boilers and heating systems we with minimum necessary minimum necessary retrofits and and we have a relatively small footprint i've lost the slide on my screen but that might be just me um, uh, we can leverage existing liquid handling. So the fact, most of the time we go from a liquid handling into a liquid handling scenario. There are benefits to that. Uh, for example, existing boiler skills, uh, trades that are already on site, they know pumps, they know, uh, they know burners, they know those aspects of the technology. So it lends itself very easily to go into that. As we mentioned, the capital investment up front is relatively inexpensive. Um, and then I'll skip a couple, but just to go recognizing that I've got some time constraints, but recognizing that when we talk about CO2 management, RFO lends itself to be an all-in solution or to be dialed in according to programs, plans, and, uh, and forecasts. So if there's an objective to re meet a 20% CO2 reduction program per year for the next five years, um, with the relative minor uh, investment for RFO consumption, that can be scaled up to meet those objectives, whether it's implemented over time or implemented immediately. So that, that's, that's important to recognize that those are one of the functions that we have. Now on the next slide, this represents a cost, a case study for two new US Northeast colleges. And, and really the intention here is not to uh, is to compare on the solid wood chip basis versus a liquid wood scenario, which is the RFO scenario. I want to fully recognize today that, that RFO is not a be-all, end-all solution for all energy applications. And there's a lot of room and there might be benefits in some circumstances to go with a solid wood heating system versus a, a liquid wood heating system, and recognizing on the benefits of both. Um, and so, but really the objective of this slide is just to note that from an overall cost perspective as it relates to the end customer, the cost solutions are relatively similar uh, barring uh, any um, regulatory benefits associated with any of them. But it represents uh, the fact that uh, we're generally in the same cost structure. Next slide. Now production is key because as you look at, at, um, at, at fuel for providing services to customers, you wanna make sure that the fuel capacity is there, that you've got scale up opportunity. And so this, just, this slide is intended just to give you a brief history on, on our, our commercial facilities. Uh, these aren't all of them. Uh, we have many in the, in the chemical side of the business, which we haven't shown here, but uh, the first one that it, I should note is the Brentford facility. It's about 11 million liters. Uh, it was built in 20, 2006 and really was the anchor and the foundation of bringing forward the commercialization of a lot of our, our customer base and the development, commercial development of the product and the testing and operational history that our customers have experienced out of that facility. The newest facility is uh, our Cote Nord. We call it the Cote Nord facility. It's in Port Cartier, Quebec on the North Shore of the St. Lawrence. It's a 40 million liter facility. Its construction cost was about $100 million. It's first of its kind as far as its scale. It was uh, started up commercially in 2018 with the production dedicated to RFO for heating customers in Eastern Canada and delivery into the US Northeast, which it has commenced delivery into the US Northeast. And then future facilities. We have scaled up the next level of the facility to um, uh, to 75 million liters, which is roughly not even quite double that last facility. And these are the new next generation facilities. Now how we've scaled them is, is to recognize how much feedstock is, is reasonably and economically available in a feed basket. Uh, can we go bigger? Absolutely, we can go bigger. 
but this represents um, a, a great a, a great size niche product a niche niche size for um, feedstock in different regions. You know, we look at, at this size, for example, for Atlantic Canada and some of those other, uh, some of the coastal regions. For example, for opportunities for export into the EU, we have tremendous momentum into the EU, and um, and that's one of our focus points. Um, and then outside of Canada, again, same issue. And maybe we go to the next slide. And I noticed JC's joined us. Um, opportunities for Atlantic Canada. What am I getting at here? I guess really I look at different regions to assess how um, how easily we can and how synergistic our type of facilities might be in those regions. And Atlantic Canada, from my from my standpoint, represents an ideal expansion region for us and a, an ideal region to to take advantage and leverage off of of RFO and RFO production. One, and, and Atlantic Canada isn't different from my, many of the other regions with respect to what's happening in the forestry industry, where there's a, a transitioning, a decline, if I can use that word, uh, but a transition not only regionally where, where fiber is coming from, but where, where those goods are being ultimately produced. So there leaves an opportunity to come alongside and um, uh, the, the existing forestry industry and diversify and provide a diversified economics for that whole program. Um, it all it we lend itself to the transformation of that whole industry of where it's going and what's happening. I also look at the ability to provide a, um, a regional product for regional consumption, kind of an energy security, if you want to call it, where not only are we applying um, local feedstock and coming synergistically with the forestry industry, but at the same time, we are providing um, a ready market for an, a ready product for a ready market. Uh, we recognize that not all markets are the same regionally, where there might be oil in some regions, or maybe gas is becoming much more abundant and available in other regions. So we recognize there may be pockets of opportunity here from a low hanging fruit perspective. But again, the focus point is local fuel for local consumption. But also, you know, when we look at development of sustainable employment, we also look at where our facilities go. They tend to go in rural environments adjacent to mills, local, uh, uh, um, in close proximity to the feedstocks. And so that also lends itself to a very attractive model when we talk about sustainable employment and, and rural and economic development. And then the final thing, as I look at it, it's, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we tend to leverage off of our high volume of RFO production in order to look at chemicals and look at new opportunities. And in this case, there's no exception with, with what we look at in Atlantic Canada and other regions is the ability to look at new chemicals, such as uh, whether it be for batteries uh, and battery uses, whether it be for binders and uh, resins and adhesives. And there's a number of items that we're working on with multiple different partners to bring that into reality, which would leverage opportunities with existing plants. Maybe we could go to the next slide. Now, one of the things we look at tremendously is, you know, I can tell you we do what we do and we do it really well. We take solid cellulosic material and we make it into a liquid product. We do that very well. Um, but we do a lot of other things we don't do very well and we don't stretch ourselves where we can't do it. And this is where, you know, our, our business model has always been on partnerships and leveraging off people that do things much better. Our Quebec facility, for example, is hosted at an Arbeck forestry site and is partially owned by Arbeck and, and Remebeck. We have relationships with other forestry groups because one of the first thing people ask us is, how are you securing your biomass? What, what does that look like? And so our realization is we can't do that as well as people that are in the industry. So obviously we look at opportunities to partner with uh, feedstock suppliers, existing mills, existing um, uh, harvesters, et cetera. And then, you know, when it comes to technology and, and people say, well, how do I know the plant's gonna work? Um, what's the risk profile look like on the ability to do that? Well, clearly, we rely on people like Honeywell and UOP to build out our technology. They, they 
supplied the equipment, for example, in our Quebec facility. And it allows us, again, to de-risk the whole, the whole program to ensure that production can happen and can happen on time and on budget and with the quality and consistency we are otherwise looking for. And the same goes through a number of different fronts, whether it be transportation and logistics, which we deliver product, you know, a truck every day to one customer or another, whether it deals with um, our chemical side of our business, we have a number of different partnerships there, whether it deals with our customer, where a lot of people would, can say, well, how does our customer, how do you support your customer? What does that look like? We bring in professionals that are, are um, ex have expertise in this field to be able to do the modification of the boilers and the control systems that are otherwise required and deliver that with uh, consistency and quality to customers. And then finally, as we go on, you know, to build in the energy companies that we need, whether it be Marathon or Chevron and different organizations that help in the downstream aspect beyond heating fuel. And this is a concept on co-processing that we might be able to, again, discuss at a later time. But really, partnerships are a key to our success of our business model. And that's really what I want to lay, put out here. And then on, finally, on the last slide, you know, I just want to run through the key points that if you remember nothing else from this, um, this presentation, you've got those, you know, five bullets. We've commercialized the use of RFO and it's a, it, it is a, re, re, uh, a viable renewable heating option. It really is. We, we deal with it commercially now. It can be competitively priced and perform as, as well as fossil fuel um, and as well as solid biomass heating. The operating experience that Ensign has, both from the, pro the production of the fuel, but also from the technical aspects of delivery of customer and customer use is, is critical when you look at these kind of things. And that experience and that reputation, that pedigree we bring to, uh, pr bring to these marketplaces. Um, you know, we would need to start a process when we go into different regions and we start different initiatives. We need to start a process and to identify local experts, to identify customers among, you know, commercial institutions and industrial fuel users. And I'm happy to say in Atlantic Canada, we've started that process and we look forward to the development of that and the opportunity to, to kind of um, continue to build that base of, uh, of knowledge and with the hopes of looking at an opportunity to build the facility for local consumption in Atlantic Canada. And we look for these partners. So, um, you know, our core starting point in many of these things is not only uh, customer um, identification, but it's also partner identification. We cannot succeed in many of our initiatives without finding key local partners that come alongside us and deal with some of the aspects we talked before. We know we're very good at what we can deliver in our in our uh, capacity, but we recognize that we're stronger by bringing in good partners and good local partners to help us along that, that line. So I see my time is, is just about up, but I think I've got a minute. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. I know we had a lot of material on those slides and I know I went through it very quickly, um, but I hope it provides a, a window at least into what we're doing, how we're doing it, uh, what our vision is, at least for Atlantic Canada and other regions, um, and kind of go from there. So, Rod, I hope that was uh, that was good, and uh, I will leave it to you for the question side. Does that work? Awesome. That's great, David. Um, <clears throat> and for anybody who's who's watching, um, this isn't David's evil twin who has joined us here. Although they both have David Goulard as the title on their screen, this is actually uh, JC. Amato, who is the VP of Finance at Ensign. So JC, welcome. Thank you for joining us as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thank you for bearing with our technical difficulties, guys, as well. Uh, you did a really good job. Thank you so much. You, you know, when we think about, um, you know, bioeconomy projects in Atlantic Canada, or just in general, I suppose, we, we look at it through the lens of, you know, um, feedstock, uh, conversion technology, markets, um, ability to attract investment, and then ability to, um, you know, engage with, you know, the regional policy or policy in your target markets and take advantage of opportunities there. And so we look at 
those five factors and, and think about how have, you know, uh, the projects or how has the project proposed addressed each of those? And I think you've just done such a fantastic job in each one of those areas that you've given us many, many things to talk about. So um, with that, I'm going to remind everybody again, if you have uh, questions, please uh, type them into the question and answer um, window. You can access that window at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button. You click on that, it'll pop up a, a window and type your answer in there or question in there. We can see it and we'll try and address it uh, along the way. So I, I think maybe one of the, the first questions that, that I see here that I think might be interesting for you guys to address is, is back to that feedstock question. And you mentioned a mix of forestry and agriculture feedstocks that you tested. Could you provide a little bit more detail on that in terms of how flexible your system is to feedstock, what feedstocks work best? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, really, when we, when we look at feedstocks, we've traditionally stuck with the low-hanging fruit, which is forestry residue. Why forestry residue is relatively available. It, it's, it's available uh, all year, all, all year round, uh, so you're not dealing with major storage, and it's also uh, consistent, um, generally consistent in its, in its form. And so that's why we've traditionally gone with wood. Can we do other things? Absolutely. And we've tested a number of different feedstocks from, you know, corn stover to uh, uh, wheat straw to you name it. Um, you know, for example, even to the point where we've uh, um, done food, food processing, barley husks, rice husks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the wood side lends itself to predictable economics, consistent supply, and, um, and the, the non-requirement to store major quantities because you're aligned, you're aligned with the industry as it's produced, you're consuming it. You know, the model I have though and other issues is a joint model that I think would be very effective where you have a plant that takes as a base load your forestry side and as a peak load other feedstocks to allow for that one consistency in recipe but two to uh, to advance on some of the cellulosic material that's otherwise available regionally so um, you know those are kind of the models that are very regionally specific for geographically what's available in the region how does it work um, but um, is something that clearly is, is in our uh, is is in our sites. Awesome, thank you, David. And and I think the forestry feedstock is a really interesting one. And, and you've you know you've laid it out very well. It's generally not um, doesn't change uh, widely with uh, with season if you're associated with a uh, you know a sawmill. Um, one question that's arisen here is, um, you know, softwood versus hardwood, and if your system has a, a preference for one over the other. That's, in, that's a very interesting question. That's a great question. Um, so the, the answer to that is not really. Um, there are times when, so, so obviously softwood and hardwood have different attributes. For example, hardwood tends to have slightly higher ash, softwood lower ash. Uh, softwood has more extractives, hardwood less extractives. Um, so depending on what we're doing, uh, we can find that uh, that softwood sometimes lends itself better. So for example, uh, the fact that softwood has lower ash, we may want to predominantly lean to softwood for some of our RFO production. Um, hardwood on the other side lends itself to other chemical attributes. It's perfectly fine for RFO fuel, fuel use. Um, but uh, it has different chemical characteristics. The extractives in hardwood lend themselves, again, to other attributes with respect to uh, chemical extraction, um, as well as, as its reactivity when you talk about uh, other applications, such as putting it into a refinery. Um, so for the most part, I'll say no, but as we go to higher value chemicals, uh, I can see it, I see a distinction in, in, in those things. But um, for now, you know, this, that's a complicated answer for a simple question, but. <laughs> That's a very good answer, thank you. Um, you know, just turning to the, the customer side of the business for a second. And, you know, you mentioned Bates College and, you know, that 
um, college would be similar in terms of, of size to other institutions, or I think it would in Atlantic Canada, and see that as an interesting opportunity. So one of the questions I think would be helpful to dive into a little bit deeper is what makes an ideal customer for Ensign? What, what, what features and characteristics, volumes or you know, interests or uh, capabilities is, is key to you know, success? Yeah, JC, would you mind taking that question for me? Yeah, sure. I mean, typically, you know, we see our customers um, as commercial partners, really. And, you know, we don't just provide fuel. We provide a fuel turnkey, a full turnkey heat service, um, all the way from helping them to do their retrofit so they can take in our RSO to providing, you know, technical services um, during, um, you know, there, there are four operations and, and troubleshooting problems if there are any, put them in touch with equipment providers, etc. Our, you know, our, our sort of our customer archetype is usually a customer with a large heating load, a commercial size or large size boiler. Um, you know, you'll find those either in the institutional space. So we talked about universities, colleges, could be a district energy system, could be a commercial user, or even an industrial um, plant with some sort of furnace. Um, you know, typically we service customers with, um, you know, a fuel oil consumption of uh, greater than 500,000 liters or so, or the equivalent in, in natural gas consumption. Um, you know, we, you know, our customers come to us because, you know, often they don't, either they don't have great capital investment budgets and, you know, they want to switch away from fossil fuels for different reasons. They could be cost, they could be environmental, and they want a, a quick a quick solution for that without having to overall their, um, their heating um, system. Or, or they just don't have the space, right, to, to put in, for example, a, a wood chip boiler. Um, so those are the kinds of customers that we typically work with. Awesome. Thank you, JC. Um, one of the questions that's come up and I think is, is very uh, relevant and timely is the idea, the notion of the environmental impact and, and maybe thinking about the, you know, the carbon footprint of your product relative to, to you know, uh, energy products derived from fossil fuels. Can you could you speak to that for uh, for a little bit? Yeah, I can take that on too. Um, you know, depending on how far we are from the customer, you know, the the distance that has to be traveled to take our fuel to the customer, you could be looking at greenhouse gas emission reductions anywhere between eighty percent and up to 95% in some cases if the customer relies say on, on bunker fuel or, or fuel oil. Um, so it depends, but you, you know, you're looking at an extra low carbon intensity fuel as we rely on a renewable, um, renewable biomass. And in our case, um, you know, forest residuals that are considered waste and, and therefore, you know, have very low sort of upstream um, carbon emissions associated with it. Also, you know, we didn't sort of dig or dive into how we liquefy wood, but our production process is extremely um, efficient. Um, the energy byproducts that come out of our conversion process are fully utilized within the plant. So that really on a net energy basis, we take in very little um, energy uh, from outside of the plant. So, uh, so overall, you're looking at an amazing greenhouse gas emission reduction um, sort of tool for, for our customers. And JC, could you describe that a little bit further? Have you, have you quantified that in terms of the carbon intensity of RFO in terms of its um, CO2 equivalent? Yeah, no, absolutely. So we have done LCA studies and I'd be happy to share um, specifics with anyone interested. Um, if you email us, you know, on our sort of info email box that you'll find on our website, you know, I can, I can, I can provide specific information. 
again, it will also it will always vary and factor in, you know, the distance that has to be traveled right between production facility and the customer. Again, overall, depending on whether the customer uses natural gas or fuel oil, you could be looking at 80 to 95 percent carbon reduction. Um, you know, and so and so that means really that our RF4 heat service is not only a heat service, but also a carbon management service, right? For customers either interested to reduce their carbon emissions on a voluntary basis, or customers like a large industrial fuel user that actually has to reduce its carbon emissions or else pay a carbon tax or have to buy cap and trade credits. And one thing that you know you may have seen on our webs on our on our slides, obviously we kind of looked at each case on a you know each client on a case by case basis as as far as pricing goes. But in cases where there exist regulatory benefits, we're able to translate those into direct customer cash savings, right? As is the case for us right now in the U.S., and that's why Memorial and Bates have been able to enjoy some some cash benefits as well by switching to our goal. Excellent, thank you, JC. We've had a number of questions coming in about the RFO product itself and, and how it differs from you know, other renewable sources of energy. And so I just wanna uh, throw a, a few out there. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about wood chips, David, in your presentation, so maybe you know, that could be, you know, one point of comparison. The, the other is, you know, biogas, and I assume what's being referred to here is a, uh, you know, a syngas. Um, and then the third is, you know, traditional liquid biofuels, you know, perhaps something, uh, you know, derived from, uh, from waste oils or something like that. So I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just speaking for a minute to the, the difference between your product and and those um, other, you know, renewable fuel products. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I, I think part of it is availability, and the other is is is, is cost. I mean, I, I'm not of a venue that I can talk about their chemical makeup and and approach. But when you talk about syngas, you talk about where it's available, how it's available. Um, it goes into a pipeline, and there's another a number of different opportunities to go into the natural gas line and so that is one option but it, when it relates to heating fuel when you're looking at liquid fuels there's not too much otherwise available most of the heating fuels uh, whether it be ethanol or whether it be um, biodiesel they traditionally are not used they're, they're almost exclusively used in a transportation mode and so they aren't available in the heating fuel mode when you look at BTU value and things like that as it relates to um, ethanol were, were approximately the same uh, value as from an ethanol perspective on a heating fuel basis. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we're trying to make is, um, is where it comes from. And cellulosic fuels have been really the target given the amount of cellulosic material available. And really the, the core difference is the fact that we are exclusively made from cellulosic biofuels taking over those resources. Um, whereas, you know, the other ones, syngas, who knows where it comes from in the sense that yes, it's most for the most part, it's landfill gas, but there's a lot of different stuff in landfills. But, um, but is, so that would be my, my biggest thing is it's really taking advantage of the abundance of cellulosic feedstocks and, and putting them in a, a bringing them into the value chain associated with renewable energy and greenhouse gas reduction. That's really what I can see the biggest focus to be. I'll just add something, you know, um, you know, all fuels are not created equal in the sense that while biogas, you know, um, can definitely provide a great greenhouse gas um, benefit, greenhouse gas reduction benefits, when you look at the socioeconomic benefits associated with biogas and you compare those with, say, you know, the jobs and, and that a plant like ours support in rural communities and, and, the and the synergies with the forest product industry and ties to the chemical, the biochemical industry, it just doesn't compare. So, yeah, 
So, you know, I, I think, and, and that's one of the things that we try to always sort of um, bring up in our conversations with investors or government is just that we offer a, not only a carbon solution, but also um, a really a great social economic development opportunity, I think, in, in, in the regions, in the clusters, in the wood baskets that we, we start our plants in. I, JC, I think that's such a great point. And one of the things we've been doing at the uh, Nova Scotia Innovation Hub is looking at the economic impact of local supply chains providing energy products that um, are a substitute for imported energy products. And you've just you've described that so well. When we use a, a you know a cellulose feedstock, a woody biomass uh, feedstock, we're supporting logging contractors, trucking contractors, tree planters, you know, thinners, uh, sawmills. There's just such a, 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 a cascading, I think is the right word the economist use, a cascading impact of that kind of supply chain. And, and I think that's such a great point, w which kind of leads me to, you know, I think the, the next question. One of the things that I know we certainly stood up and paid attention to was the partnership you formed in Port Perche with Arbeck. And you just did such a good job of de-risking, you know, the feedstock side of your business by forming that partnership. Um, so the question that has arisen is, you know, tell us about what your ideal kind of industrial, you know, co-location partner looks like. What, what would you love to see from one of those? There's a few of those people who are on the, uh, on the video call here in Atlantic Canada, where I'm sure are very interested in that. And not like you're putting me on the spot or anything, hey, Rod. <laughs> uh, no, it's, you know, the reality is, um, you know, the forestry industry is a very sp specialized industry and the, and the people that are in it are skilled, uh, many running generationally back, um, and they have a skill set that, you know, is it's not easily duplicated like many professions. So, you know, the, the reality is we'd love to see someone who, uh, you know, a company or a group that have existing uh, forestry operations that look at, um, you know, the, the uh, processing, the primary processing of wood where we can come in and take that secondary processing of wood. What, we, what it allows us to do is that they continue to focus and build the economics of the existing, of their existing business in one scenario. And we come alongside and, and, and fill the gap as it might relate to the, the changes that have occurred in, in where biomass can go and for what price it goes for. So I'm not gonna compete with the two by four wood, but I will compete with the sawmill uh, sawdust and, and the chips that were made for otherwise other residual formats. Um, so ideally I wanna come in and be synergistic to an operation. Um, so someone that, you know, most of the mills have plenty of, of land available around them. Uh, in, in Port Carche, we're adjacent to the mill. We want to avoid transportation of, um, of, of biomass. It's very expensive and it adds to cost. So we want to be adjacent to a mill and, and partner with that mill, allow them to continue doing what they're doing, come synergistically with their business, leverage their economics and their, and their skill sets and their infrastructure and, and kind of move forward from there. And that, that's kind of how we look at it. Rod, I don't know if that that's sufficient, but that's, that's, that's a key for us. Yeah, no, that, that's great, David. Appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things I find interesting about, um, you know, Ensign's technology is that you fit very well with a sawmill. You know, you don't require effluent treatment. So, uh, you know, a, a sophisticated and capital intense effluent treatment system isn't necessary. And so the ability to co-locate with sawmills is, um, as you've proven, is uh, is a good model, and I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And then, as you described, you know, the ability to take, you know, you're not competing with the sawmilling sector for their fiber, your saw logs, and your stud wood. So taking byproducts from that process and, and creating higher value from that that makes a lot of sense. We're um, we're getting close to time. There's been a number of questions that have arisen here, I, and I just want to say thank you, everybody, for all of your very insightful questions. I've been trying to digest them and convert them into uh, meaningful questions to, to 
the David and JC and group them together where I, where I can. So um, I really appreciate all this. We're trying to get through it. Um, there have been a number of questions from our participants around, um, you know, the future refinement of, you know, your RFO or your bio crude to make uh, other products and byproducts from the process, whether or not there's a, a solid biochar or biocarbon product, and you know what you see as the opportunities and, and kind of directions for those products. Can you speak to that for a minute? Um, sure. I mean, JC, do you want to start with that one and then uh, I'll take it over? Sure. So our process is fast paralysis, right? So uh, very simply, it's the rapid heating of biomass in the absence of oxygen. And um, out of it comes three products. There's a syn gas, there's, um, then there's our liquid stream, and then there's a solid, uh, you know, sometimes people call it biochar stream. And really, like, our plants are flexible as far as, like, what we want to maximize and what we want to do with those streams. Um, so I don't want to dwell too much about what we've done to date because it's not necessarily what we can do or what we want to do in the future. But all that to say is that all of these streams can have different product applications. So we've talked about the liquid stream mostly today, right? And you know, a lot of it right now for us goes to renewable heating products. Um, David has touched on it and we can have a separate conversation about it, but one application for the liquid stream that we're working on right now is um, sort of upgrading it to finish transportation fuels and there's different ways to do that. Um, and uh, for the other streams, again, there's many different applications that we are either working on or have already applied. So those byproducts can either be used within the plant to service the energy needs of the plant. Um, the biochar itself can be converted into high value uh, carbon products. Um, it can also be used as a soil enhancement products if there's a market for it um, around the plant. Um, the, similarly, the syn gas that we produce can be converted into fuel products. So again, you know, you're looking almost at a, um, at a biomass conversion technology platform that lends itself to a multitude of product applications depending on the markets that exist around the plant. Awesome. So I don't know if, it, you know, I know it's, <laughs> I'm opening a lot of doors in answering that question, but it's the, it's the reality of, of what our technology is, yeah. Yeah, I, I, JC, I, I think that's very common to, you know, many of the uh, bioeconomy um, businesses that we work with. They focus on getting really good, as David described in his presentation earlier, really good about, you know, producing their primary product. And then the byproducts of, of that, um, you know, kind of follow along. But there are, are all kinds of interesting applications and, and you know, the opp opportunities for biocarbon you know, either as a soil amendment or a filtration medium, or as a, a co competitor of some of adv with advanced carbon materials, I think are really interesting and uh, and unique and worth exploring. I think there's there's development work to do there, um, not just by you, you folks, but by others as well. Absolutely, that, uh, I think it would make some really interesting research for some of the researchers who might be joining us on the call. So, being conscious that we're almost um, at time. Um, I, I didn't, we didn't prep for this, JC, David, so I'm, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, but I don't think too much. I want to leave you with the last word. What have, you know, in your presentation, in your questions, anything that, um, you know, hasn't been explored fully that you'd like to, or any last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Wow. Last thoughts. JC, do you want to go on that one? <laughs> I'll start and I'll let you, I'll leave you with the last word. But um, I mean, for me, first of all, I'll just say that both David and I and the company itself is very excited about the opportunities in Atlantic Canada. We think that it's a region where um, there's a lot of potential for Ensign's technology and Ensign's experience to bring value, not only to 
you know, your first product um, industry, but also just to customers who want to switch away from expensive fuels and also, you know, benefit the environment. Um, I'll just say that in that regard, I think government has a key role to play. Um, I think we've made the point in our slides that while we don't necessarily need incentives to be competitive, incentives help finding, uh, you know, customer, like the first moving customers in Atlantic Canada, right? And also helps with providing instant cash, uh, you know, incentives to, to customers who, you know, ultimately will be taking a chance. You know, although we have a very long operating history, we, we haven't operated yet in Atlantic Canada. So we recognize that uh, we kind of need to bring that, to build that trust and, and, and start expanding there. Um, you know, I know in Nova Scotia, for example, they've released recently some public tenders uh, for buildings to switch away from fuel to biomass. And uh, I believe those tenders were very much limited to wood chip uh, biomass systems. And so, you know, those sorts of barriers are regrettable in the sense that, you know, if government keeps the door open to all renewable heating solutions, right? solid wood chips as well as our phone and others, right? It enables customers to make the right decision for themselves, right? So in some cases, it will make very much sense to use wood chips. In others, customers may prefer a liquid solution like ours. So again, it's just the, that role of the government to create an enabling environment for solutions like ours. And I think there's a bit of work maybe to be done in Atlantic Canada on that. Awesome, JC. That's some great insight and, and great uh, advice for us. Thank you. And David, I, I can see you're, you, you've thought of something here that you No, are. no, I just, I just, JC JC's, is, is eloquent in what he said there. I think the one thing that I always look at is uh, I'm a builder. And so that's the, the way I look at myself. And without, without starting anything, you never get anywhere. And so the way I look at it is, you know, what we have today as it relates to our product is the beginning, it's not the end. You know, when you look at economic uh, progress and what you can generate from what we do, um, you mentioned the research side, you know, and I'm excited, I'm ecstatic about some of the components that can come out of what we do. And so really, I look at an opportunity to build on a foundation that we've developed, right? To build a, a, regional, a regional development pathway for a foundation that not only economically provides a solution and um, uh, is enables a group to achieve carbon neutrality, if that's, you know, or, or a reduction of carbon, but it also provides for a foundational industry. And that's really how I look at what we do. Uh, we're at our uh, infancy in that, but it's, and this is an area where I'm excited to look at the opportunities that we could do, uh, that we could have in Atlantic Canada, not only with the educational uh, institutions and your research groups, et cetera, on the, those frills that I think are substantial, but also on the foundational aspect. So, no, I'm excited to hear it. No, that, that's awesome, David, great insight. And I'll throw in a little plug to say that, I think what I'm about to say is, is true of Atlantic Canada, it's certainly true of Nova Scotia, but we have a, a higher density of universities and university graduates than any other region in the country. And we've got a lot of smart uh, you know, researchers who uh, are looking for you know, these type projects. So there's a, there's a lot of willing support here. Perfect. So with that folks, I see we're at time. I, I wanna, you know, thank uh, JC and David again for a job very well done. Uh, um, we know that you've been here as a commitment of your time and resources. So that hasn't gone unnoticed and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, also, I'd like again to recognize the partners in our Atlantic Biocon virtual speaker series, BioMB, CCNB, and O. Ignite Atlantic and the Nova Scotia Innovation Hub. And I'd be remiss if I didn't um, point to my partner who's been working hard in the background to overcome some of our early technical dis uh, difficulties here, Ryan Duff, uh, who's done a great job. Thank you for uh, all your work there, Ryan. We'll get, we'll get some of these things smoothed out here for our, our, our second uh, speaker series. Um, and so with that piece, um, we don't have the confirmed speaker and topic yet for our next um, uh, series, but expect that to be released soon. We'll certainly keep everyone up to date over email. 
um, and expect to conduct that one uh, in June. And finally, a big thanks to everybody who tuned in. Really appreciate all your time today. Please keep up, keep up your great work in supporting the growth of uh, Canada's bioeconomy. Uh, we look forward to connecting again next time. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I know.